Good morning. So again, uh, thank you very much, class, for coming uh, today. Um, so as I mentioned, we will have two recorded lectures. The first is uh, uh, finishing up with our discussion on piglet nutrition. And then the last one, which will be on Friday, will be our uh, lecture on uh, growing finishing pig nutrition. So one of the uh, keys in uh, maximizing performance of nursery pigs would be the feeding program. So it is typical that we would have uh, a two-phase feeding program for piglets. So the first diet will uh, is usually fed uh, during uh, uh, lactation, and that is the booster phase. So this is the same creep feed that we discussed last time. And then the second uh, phase would be the pre-starter phase. And so as we could see here, we have here eight different brands of feed. That's from A to H. And uh, so we will have the two phases. The booster will be in red, and then the pre-starter will be the green. And one thing that you'll notice is that majority of the feeding programs will shift from the booster to the pre-starter phase uh, about three to seven days or three to ten days post weaning while well, there is a brand uh, which is brand A where they recommend to shift from the booster to, pro to the pre-starter phase uh, prior to weaning and that is uh, not typical you know. uh, and then we have a brand uh, which is brand C where we have a three phase feeding program okay so most of uh, commonly, we would have the two-phase feeding program. So the booster diet would typically be a more complex diet. It's a more digestible diet, higher in lactose. And then uh, we keep them on that diet immediately post-weaning so that they will not, uh, uh, they won't need to adjust to a different diet uh, post-weaning. And then uh, we shift it to a less uh, complex diet, which is the pre-starter phase. So this diet would typically would have lower lactose. If the booster diet would have about 8 to 12 percent or as high as 24 percent lactose, the pre-starter diet would be between 4 to 8 percent depending on the nutritionist. Now what is important is uh, the performance effects of these different feeding programs. So this is an example where we have three different feeding programs, A, B, and C, and you have the performance of the nursery pigs on those three uh, feeding programs. So for average daily gain, uh, what we see here is that pigs fed uh, B and C had better average daily gain than pigs fed uh, feeding program A. And that is because pigs fed um, uh, the feeding program B and C had higher average daily feed intake compared to uh, feeding program A. And that may be because of differences in complexity. We may assume that uh, B and C are more complex diets. That's why feed intake is higher compared to uh, feeding program A. So when we look at the economics, so uh, as expected, B and C, because it is a more complex diet, it is also a more expensive feed compared to A. That's why feed cost per pig uh, is greater in those two programs compared to A. But because performance growth rate is faster, the value of gain in both A and B is greater uh, almost by 200, uh, by 200 pesos compared to feeding program A. So the thought here is that yes, A is cheaper compared to B and C, but because performance is poorer, then the value of gain uh, is much lower. So when we look at margin over feed cost, which is our economic return, uh, in programs B, compared to A, that's almost uh, 70 pesos uh, per pig greater for B. And then for C, it's about, what, uh, 50 
pesos per pig higher compared to A. So, which feeding program do you choose? A, B, or C? So, if we base it of cost, then maybe A is the cheapest diet, but the economic return is highest uh, with B. So, what does this mean? It means that... Uh, at the end of the day, what is more important is the economic return that our farmers get from feeding uh, the diets. And so, though feeding program B is a more expensive diet than A, you end up with higher profit with B compared to A. So, um, it is uh, more logical or it is, uh, uh, it is much better for the farmer to, produce, to, to use feeding program B compared to A. Now, another important consideration in uh, nursery diets is the type of ingredients. So last time we talked about um, the importance of diet complexity. And there are key, three key feeding, feed ingredients in piglet diets that helps improve uh, post-winning performance. So the first would be the energy sources as well as the levels. The second would be the specialty protein sources and their levels. And then the last would be specific feed additives that have benefits or positive benefits in performance for our piglets. So one of the most important considerations when we are designing diets for piglets is uh, the immaturity of their gastrointestinal tract. And because their digestive system is not yet fully developed, their enzyme activities is also uh, less developed. So for example, here we have a figure uh, where we have the age of the piglet on the x-axis and then the enzyme activity on the y-axis. And so if weaning occurs at four weeks of age, what we see here is that lactase uh, is the only enzyme that has high activity, whereas amylase, lipase, and protease have lower enzyme activities in this period, which means that um, among nutrients, lactose, which is from milk, is the only nutrient that is easily digested by the pig. But after weaning and as the, as the piglet grows older, their ability to, uh, to digest uh, lactose becomes poorer. As you can see, lactose ac activity decreases significantly, while the enzyme activities for amylase, lipase, and protease increase uh, as the piglet grows older. And so this means that at this age, these pigs will then be more capable of digesting normal carbohydrates fats, and proteins. So this would have a big impact on how we design our nursery diets. So knowing these changes in enzyme activities, this, should, this would be then a guide for us to determine what type of ingredients we should include in our piglet diets to optimize performance. So since lactase activity is highest during the first four week uh four week uh four weeks of the life of the pig then we typically would utilize uh high levels of milk uh, or lactose to supply the energy to this to these pigs and since um amylase protease and lipase activity is low at this period then we need to provide them specialty protein sources so that they will be able to easily digest this uh, type of feed ingredients. But as we, we move forward from four weeks onward, then we need to reduce the inclusion of these ingredients because their advantage becomes much less. So that will then be a guide on the level of uh, inclusion of these ingredients uh, in the diet.
Then in terms of protein sources, uh, so because of the poorer digestibility in the first four weeks uh, of the life of the pig, then we typically would limit soybean meal. But as the pigs grow older, their ability to degrade plant proteins becomes better. And that uh, allows us to shift uh, the pigs from specialty protein sources to soybean meal, which is the in inexpensive uh, protein source. So this is the reason why uh, when we move from the booster to the pre-starter phase, we need to shift as quickly as possible so that we can uh, reduce the cost of uh, the diets. So in piglet diets, we have uh, a number of energy sources. The last time we talked about lactose. So lactose is milk sugar. And, uh, and the typical sources of lactose would be spray dried whey. Uh, usually we would use uh, sweet whey. And uh, this ingredient is a byproduct of cheese making. And so the, you have the lactose portion and it would also contain some protein. Now, if we remove protein altogether, as well as the minerals, then what we will have is pure lactose. Okay, And then uh, the proteinized whey or whey permeate is, uh, is whey uh, without, the protein, uh, without the protein. So the protein is removed and, uh, and uh, the product would then be dried. And, um, and that would uh, be higher in terms of lactose content compared to whey. So if whey is about 65% uh, uh, lactose, whey permeate is about 85%. So it's a better source of whey compared to uh, spray dried whey. Now, carbohydrate uh, sources uh, are also good sources of energy. Uh, but there are differences uh, among different cereals. So corn would be the most common energy source. And uh, one of the things that we do to improve the digestibility of corn is we extrude it. So extrusion is a process where heat and pressure is applied on the material. And that increases the digestibility uh, of starch uh, because it gelatinizes. And that will then be easily digested uh, by the piglet. Now, rice is a better cereal compared to both corn and wheat, uh, but the challenge with rice is, uh, is the cost. It is not available or it, is, it has a limited supply uh, in the Philippines, but whenever rice is available, it is a good cereal uh, to be used in piglet diets. And then another starch source is cassava. Cassava meal is about 60 to 80 percent uh, uh, starch and it also has high digestibility. The challenge is uh, we cannot feed cassava uh, in mash form because it is a powdery product, very fine. So that uh, has a negative effect on uh, feed intake in piglets. So if cassava will be used in the diets, then it is better to be provided as pellets. And then the concentrated source of energy would be the fats and the oils. And later I will discuss uh, some of the considerations in choosing fats and oils for piglet diets. So this is a study that we did uh, some time ago wherein we evaluated uh, ten different, uh, no, seven different sources of uh, whey and compared that to a negative control, which is a corn-soy diet. So uh, it is expected that the corn-soy diet would perform poorer than the diets with whey. And I believe this is about 10% in the diet. And from what we can see in the result of the experiment, source A and B were better than the negative control. However, uh, C, F, and G is intermediate, and B and D is just the same as corn. So what we see here is a wide variability in the responses to different sources of whey. And again, the reason here is because whey is a byproduct. 
one of the things uh, that is done in the production of whey is a drying step. And to dry it, obviously temperature uh, is applied. And if there is excessive heating, it can denature the whey proteins. And as you could see here, you have here a picture of two different sources of uh, whey with the one on the left being uh, brown or light brown compared to the one on the right, which is white. So we can suspect that the brown is excessively heated. And so you expect that the protein in this material would be poorer uh, in quality. And so the advantages of this way compared to a, a corn soy diet may not be uh, as much. And the other uh, issue with whey is uh, the mineral concentration. So the higher the ash content of whey, the lower is the energy value. So that's why one of the things that we check uh, in whey is uh, the ash content. And then we adjust the energy value of the whey source based on the ash content that we measure in the lab. Now, Fat sources are, uh, are important in piglet diets because one of the major limitations in piglets is um, low energy intake. So if we want to increase or maximize the growth of these pigs, we really need to push in as much energy as we can to those pigs. And so fat is a very effective tool in, uh, in increasing the energy density of the diet. But there are also different differences in the sources uh, of fat uh, or dietary fat in pigs. And as you could see here, uh, coconut oil, corn oil, and soybean oil are good sources of fat, particularly coconut oil because majority of the fatty acids in coconut oil are short to medium chain fatty acids. So this is uh, easily digested by the pig. While uh, bad fat sources would be tallow, as well as hydrolyzed fats, which would typically contain long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids, that is much more difficult for uh, piglets to uh, digest. So here is an old study that looked at the ratio of unsaturated and saturated fatty acids. So that is the US ratio. And they looked at the effect, uh, its effect on fat digestibility in nursery pigs. And as we could see here, as the U.S. ratio increased, fat digestibility increased and then plateaued somewhere around 3.5 or maybe somewhere around 2. We didn't get any uh, uh, significant improvement in fat digestibility and then it declined. And if we just if we break it down by U.S. ratio, if it's more than 1.5, the fat digestibility is between 85 to 92 percent. But if the U.S. ratio is uh, between 1 to 1.3, fat digestibility uh, ranges between 35 to 75 percent. So what this means is that the more unsaturated uh, the fat is in the diet, the more digestible it is. But it's not just fatty acid uh, 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 composition or the degree of unsaturation is important. What is also important is the chain length. So we have here a study, an old study done to evaluate the effect of chain length on fat digestibility. So you have short chain, which is less than uh, 14 carbons medium chain, which is between C14 to 18, and then long chain having 18 uh, or more carbons. And you have there the age of the pig. So you have three weeks and seven weeks. And the first thing you've noticed is that the digestibility of fat in the three-week-old pigs is lower than that in pigs that are four weeks old. And the other thing that we see is... Um, uh, the differences between short, medium chain, and long chain, with short chain fatty acids having the highest, uh, highest digestibility, while long chain fatty acids are poorly digested by three week old uh, pigs. Their abilities improve in time, but still, long chain fatty acids are much less digested compared to short 
or medium chain fatty acids. So this should be a guide in the selection of the fat source that you use in your piglet diets. Now moving to protein. So soybean meal is the conventional source of uh, protein because of its high availability or wide availability, its uh, high amino acid content and good digestibility. But the problem is when we feed soybean meal to piglets, it has a negative impact on intestinal morphology. You see on the picture on the slide, so the one on the left is pigs fed soybean meal, while on the right is pigs fed milk proteins. And as you could see, uh, pigs fed soybean meal had uh, 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 a lot of uh, villi uh, atrophied, destroyed, it's like uh, uh, you could really tell that the villi is not healthy. While pigs fed the milk proteins have very long healthy villi. So this would then have an effect uh, not just on the digestibility of nutrients, but on the incidence of diarrhea. And that's why using soybean meal in piglets is, uh, or in piglet diets is uh, limited. So the reason why this occurs when we feed soybean meal to piglets is the presence of anti-nutritional factors. So there are four major uh, uh, types of anti-nutritional factors in soybean meal. The first is uh, the trypsin inhibitors, which we discussed in Animal Science 102. So again, what trypsin inhibitors do does is it binds to trypsin. And remember, it is trypsin that activates the rest of the proteolytic enzymes in the duodenum. So if trypsin is inhibited, then that will negatively affect protease activity. And that would lead to a reduction in the digestibility of protein. Another problem with soybean meal is the presence of antigens. And these are uh, the storage proteins, uh, glycinin and beta-conglycinin. And when it is present, it causes transient hypersensitivity. It's like an allergic, uh, allergic reaction uh, to these antigens, which leads to the uh, damages to the villi. And again, that will negatively affect uh, protein digestion. Then you have lectins, which are proteins uh, that are resistant to proteolytic digestive enzymes. And when it is also present, it damages the intestinal villi. And then finally, you have the alpha-galactosides. Uh, these are the non-digestible oligosaccharides, or NDOs, specifically raffinose, verbascos, and stachyos. And uh, uh, these oligosaccharides have a negative effect on the energy digestibility of soybean meal. So these are the four major uh, anti-nutritional factors that are present in soybean meal, which have a, a significant impact on the on performance of our nursery pigs. And that's why uh, our intervention is we limit the inclusion of soybean meal uh, in the pre-starter diet. So with these anti-nutritional factors, uh, one of the ways that we remove the effects is by further processing of uh, soybean meal. And there are a number of different processing techniques to uh, remove the effects of uh, these anti-nutritional factors. So we have a conventional soybean meal where it is hexane extracted. And the purpose of hexane extraction is to maximize the removal of the oil from the beans or from the meal. Uh, and one of the benefits of hexane extraction is the removal or the reduction of non-digestible oligosaccharides. So that will then uh, help improve uh, the energy value of uh, soybean meal. But the problem is in the production of regular soybean meal, different levels of heat is applied to remove the hexane from the from the meal and when it is excessively heated then you can potentially have heat damage soybean meal so later we will talk about that um, so alternatively 
uh, what we use are uh, are different kinds of uh, processed uh, soybean products. The first is called extruded expelled soybean meal, where soybean meal is first extruded, and that would uh, inactivate uh, the some of the anti nutritional factors like trypsin inhibitors and uh, antigens, which are heat labile. And then after extrusion, then uh, the oil is extracted uh, via mechanical extraction. And that is what we call expeller. So it is extruded, then it is expelled. Then the next uh, processed uh, soy product is the enzyme-treated soybean meal. This is a process where uh, soybean meal is uh, pre-treated with a proprietary uh, combination of enzymes. And those enzymes would then degrade uh, the anti-nutritional factors as well as break down some of the fiber fractions in soybean meal that can help improve the digestibility of not just amino acids but also of energy uh, in this material. Another type of processing is fermentation. So we have fermented soybean meal. So soybean meal, it is inoculated with uh, bacteria. It may, as, it may be aspergillus, it may be bacillus, and the, the effect will be the same. So the bacteria will then degrade um, uh, different components of soybean meal through uh, fermentation and that will then improve the digestibility of nutrients as well as remove the anti-nutritional factors. And then you have the soy protein concentrate, um, which is a high um, uh, quality protein source. Um, it will typically contain about 85%, and the reason is because uh, the uh, carbohydrates in soybean meal is removed and so when you remove the carbohydrate part then you increase the concentration of the rest of the uh, nutrients in soybean meal so that's why it is a concentrated product and then you have soy protein isolate which is uh, uh, an improvement of uh, the soy protein concentrate product uh, but uh, and the characteristics will be the same, except that uh, commercially this is a product that we will uh, we no longer uh, see. So the following table shows the composition of different processed soy products. So you have soybean meal at the the end, and then you have EE soybean meal. You have enzyme treated soybean meal fermented soybean meal, SPC, and SPI. So you have here the protein content. So soybean meal contains about 47, 48% protein. And uh, EE soybean meal or the extruded expelled soybean meal is about this, uh, is, is slightly lower. And that is because it has higher levels of fat. So it is essentially a regular soybean meal with some fat. So uh, it is... Uh, uh, relatively lower in protein but higher in energy. Then you have the enzyme treated soybean meal uh, and fermented soybean meal which contains about 55% uh, protein and then you have SPC and SPI. I think a while ago I mentioned SPC has 85%. It's the other way around. SPC has about 65% and then SPI uh, is 85 percent. So I think again the SPI, the difference here uh, with SPC is uh, you isolate the protein. So once you've degraded the carbohydrates, you, you separate the protein and that's why you have a higher protein product. Uh, fat content does not vary much among sources except for that extruder expelled soybean meal. Starch content is about the same. Uh, and then the NDF content, particularly for SPI, is very low compared to uh, uh, regular uh, soybean meal. And so that will then make it a very good uh, product, uh, except that, uh, as I mentioned, it is not commercially available. 
The next table shows the uh, carbohydrate and the trypsin inhibitor activity of the different uh, soybean products. So again, you have stachyose and raffinose, which are non-digestible oligosaccharides or alpha-galactosides. Uh, and you have their, the typical levels that you would have in soybean meal. And what you see here is the effect of processing. So for the extruder expelled soybean meal, uh, there is some reduction, but very little reduction in oligosaccharides. While for fermented enzyme-treated soybean meal, soy protein concentrate and SPI, there is practically very little uh, alpha-galactosides left. And this is the reason why these ingredients would have higher energy value than regular soybean meal. Now, the other uh, thing that we have in this table is the trypsin inhibitor activity. So part of the reason why we process is we want to remove these trypsin inhibitors. So you have there for soybean meal. And uh, as we could see with the enzyme, uh, with the extruder, extruded expelled soybean meal, it's about the same as regular soybean meal. So it does not uh, remove uh, the anti-nutritional factor. Uh, but fermentation, as well as enzyme treatment, uh, effectively reduces the concentration of trypsin, inhibitor, trypsin inhibitors. That's why these two ingredients have higher amino acid digestibility than regular soybean meal. So the acceptability of these ingredients in piglets is much better than the use of regular soybean meal. Now there are also other uh, specialty protein sources uh, that are derived from animal origin. So one of the most common and considered to be the standard among all specialty protein sources is spray dried animal plasma. So it contains about 70% protein and it is a byproduct of the packing industry. So once blood is collected, uh, the red blood cells is separated and then uh, what they have left is the plasma. And then they dry this and ground and that is uh, uh, spray dried animal plasma. And because spray drying is a very uh, it is the least aggressive of all the dry, uh, drying processes. It keeps the amino acids intact and uh, uh, it is not heat damage. So the digestibility of amino acids in this product is very high. And this ingredient is, uh, as I mentioned, the standard uh, in piglet diets because it is a very good feed, uh, feed ingredient. Uh, when we have animal plasma in the diet, uh, it improves uh, feed intake of piglets significantly. And uh, the other benefit of animal plasma is it contains immunoglobulins. So those immunoglobulins can then provide some immunity uh, to piglets. Uh, but the problem is it is a very expensive product. So one of the activities that we do in nutrition research is looking for potential replacements for spray dried animal plasma in piglet diets. So we hope to find something uh, that can have the same effect but cheaper than animal plasma. Now another common animal protein source uh, used in piglet diets would be fish meal. So it contains about the same amount of protein as animal plasma, 70%, and this is a byproduct of fish processing. And because it's a byproduct, uh, there are some uh, uh, regional differences in the types of fish that is used in processing. So here in the Philippines, uh, it may probably be more of two uh, of uh, sardines or sardine meal, and usually it will contain more of the scales and the heads and the tails, and not much of the meat. And so the value of those fish meal sources would be a lot lower. So typically they would contain about 50% protein, so which is much less than what we would typically have if you have a, a good, uh, if you have a whole fish or if you use whole fish in the production of fish meal. But if you could get it, it's a good quality protein source. It stimulates feed intake. Uh, it doesn't smell very good. Uh, it smells like fish but it's very appetizing to piglets. 
Then another uh, specialty animal protein source is the spray dry blood products. So a while ago we talked about animal plasma. So once they separate the red blood cells, if they spray dry that, that will be spray dried animal blood. We already talked about spray dried animal plasma, and then you have the spray dried blood cells. Okay, so so these are all these all blood products uh, are very good ingredients, very high in protein. The digestibility is also very high, but it is also very expensive. And one of the problems also with blood products is it contains very low levels of isoleucine, which is an essential amino acid. And so when you use high levels of blood products in the diet, isoleucine becomes limiting. So that's why we cannot use a lot of blood uh, products in the diet. So typically, it will only be about 1.25 to 1.5% of the diet. Now, feed additives uh, in piglet diets is also uh, important because uh, some of these feed additives play a very important role in, um, uh, in achieving uh, better piglet performance. So one of the most common feed additives that is used are in-feed antibiotics, and the purpose is to promote growth. Uh, but as uh, we know by now, antibiotics are are slowly uh, being removed from the diets and so our attention now is more focused on alternatives to these AGPs and one of the most common would be chemotherapeutic agents so this is uh, zinc oxide or copper sulfate so if we add uh, zinc oxide uh, in the diet 3000 ppm it is very effective in reducing diarrhea occurrences the same for copper sulfate, uh, but not as effective as zinc oxide. It reduces diarrhea and also promotes uh, growth. And typically, you will add it at about around 125 ppm. And then you have the acidifiers or organic acids. We use that in piglet diets uh, to help the piglet reduce gut pH. So, so that will help improve protein digestibility. Because of the low uh, digestive enzyme activity, adding feed enzymes to piglet diets can help uh, the pig uh, digest uh, uh, normal, uh, simple nutrients, and that could help us improve, uh, reduce the cost of the diets. Another alternative to antibiotics would be the probiotics, the prebiotics, and the symbiotics. So again, probiotics are live bacteria that we add to the feed. These are good bacteria. And so by, um, by changing uh, the microflora, we shift uh, the microflora towards good bacteria, and that will provide a good uh, uh, environment uh, in the gut uh, that can lead to better, uh, better and healthier uh, villi and uh, uh, can reduce uh, diarrhea. For prebiotics, these are usually oligosaccharides that are food of this good bacteria. So the effect is the same, while symbiotics are a combination of the two. Uh, now, we also use certain feed additives to improve the quality of the diet. So flavors and sweeteners are added in the diet to make it more appealing in terms of both smell and taste. But as we discussed uh, before in Animal Science 102, the purpose of these uh, flavors and sweeteners is more related to marketing than to the pigs. Uh, and that is because it does not really have any positive effect. And so it's really changing, uh, branding your diet for a particular smell, uh, smell in the market. So those are the aromas. So one of the changes in uh, piglet uh, uh, diets today as compared to maybe five uh, to ten years ago is that from the science of nutrition on just looking at performance, uh, now we are more interested in looking at the science of disease. So how can we prevent diseases, particularly gastrointestinal diseases, reduce inflammation in the gut, prevent colonization of pathogens, 
reduce the shedding of pathogens, and improving the disease resistance in pigs through the diet. And so that's why you see a lot of research now that focuses on gut health uh, because it's, uh, it is something now that we realize uh, as an important ingredient in improving performance of pigs. So there are a number of things that can be used to replace AGP effects. So this is a review done by Dr. John Plasky of Australia. He is a, a world-renowned scientist. So on the left, you have different feed additives and the level of efficacy. And then you have different manage management techniques and the level of efficacy. And as you could see, uh, the stars or the pluses are much more on management techniques. So the, the concept of uh, replacing antibiotics is start with management. Consider all in, all out. Make sure that you have good hygiene, good vaccination program, provide uh, drinking, good uh, quality water, uh, provide good, uh, provide colostrum, and make sure that uh, all the pigs have sufficient intake of colostrum. All of those management techniques has, uh, uh, can improve our abilities in replacing antibiotic growth, antibiotic growth promoters. Now, in terms of feed additives, uh, zinc oxide, copper sulfate, and enzymes are the most effective, while the others are much less. You know? So maybe replacing antibiotics will take a combination of different products so that we can uh, effectively uh, remove antibiotics in our nursery diets. Then uh, processing. Processing also has an effect on the performance uh, of pigs. So we would typically provide them pelleted diets. And as we could see here, this is a series of uh, five uh, and, uh, experiments for nursery pigs and 15 experiments in growing finishing pigs. And you see the improvement of pellets versus mash. So in terms of feed efficiency. So in nursery pigs, it's about 9% uh, improvement. And that is greater than in growing finishing pigs. So providing them pelleted diets has a positive benefit uh, in improving uh, nursery pig performance. Then finally, uh, if you if the farm uses uh, dry feeders, as you could see here, then it's important that we properly adjust the feeders. We don't fill up the pan, the, the, which is the bottom of the feeder. Hindi hindi siya dapat puno, no? So as you could see here, uh, you can control the amount of feed that comes out. And this is what it should look like. This is the proper uh, dry feeder adjustment. The one on top is for nursery pigs. The one on the bottom is for growing, finishing pigs. Okay, so the take-home message for this section uh, in uh, feeding nursery pigs so we discussed uh, previously that good nutrition is critical, especially in the first week after weaning, which is a transition phase. So the performance that we get in this period would have a big impact uh, on lifetime performance. The second important point is that in piglets, feed intake drives growth performance. So if we can stimulate feed intake, that would drive growth rates. And complexity of the diet is one of the most important considerations, particularly in the first few weeks after weaning. And then finally, nursery and overall performance depends on how well we start. So again, we have to make sure that feed and water is available in the first seven days. We make sure that we do the proper feeder management. And then at the end of the day, it's really about stockmanship. So uh, we try to put the best people in the nursery, particularly uh, in the first seven days, so that we can allow uh, better performance in this period that will have uh, uh, a payoff uh, in the end.